My name is Cesar Pereira. I am the chair of the Brazil branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, CIARB. And um, I, it's, a, it's a big pleasure to be with all of you uh, today uh, and to have our first um, uh, uh, event uh, uh, dealing with, uh, the, with technology and dispute resolution uh, based on a project that, uh, that the Brazil branch has started uh, some time ago uh, of developing different areas of expertise within the branch. Uh, uh, we have here with us Kaimin uh, Sfir, uh, who is the head of the subgroup of technology and dispute resolution, um, uh, which uh, with subgroup, uh, which is uh, responsible for this uh, webinar that we're starting right now. And um, this um, event uh, has uh, to do with um, development that we are all uh, certainly, uh, we have all uh, certainly been feeling for the past few months, which is this acceleration of, uh, of uh, 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 the, uh, the, the need for virtual solutions in dispute resolution. Uh, we, we have all uh, been um, uh, 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 becoming used to um, uh, virtual hearings, to the, the substitution, uh, to the replacement of uh, uh, the exchange of documents for, uh, for, for, for uh, a, 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 a virtual uh, documentation, for electronic uh, documents. And all, all these things are happening. Uh, but um, and, and actually, uh, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators was one of the pioneers in discussing virtual hearings. And uh, as you may know, um, in April, uh, the uh, CIR uh, issued uh, some guidelines on online dispute resolution and, and, and virtual hearings. But actually, we, we, uh, we the the uh, the questions, uh, the issues that we would like to discuss here today go much beyond that, and that's why we have. Uh, such a uh, qualified uh, panel um, of uh, scholars and practitioners uh, and uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, who are uh, on the forefront of uh, not only virtual hearings or, 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 or an electronic exchange of documents, but actually a change in the nature of dispute, resol dispute resolution, uh, change in uh, nature in the nature of how uh, how we structure uh, the process uh, for uh, resolving uh, disputes, uh, and, and that involves uh, online dispute resolution. That involves artificial intelligence. Uh, that that involves um, uh, uh, the use of data uh, to uh, analyze. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and optimize dispute resolution in, in general. Uh, you may, in, in, in different jurisdictions, uh, you, you, may, you may have uh, come across uh, situations in which um, government actions, in, and we can take that as a proxy for, uh, for any type of decision making, a uh, government action has been has 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 been relying on algorithms for faster and allegedly more effective and more efficient uh, decisions, but on the other hand, has um, come across uh, difficulties in terms of how those algorithms are structured, um, what type of biases may be hidden uh, behind those algorithms. Uh, uh, what type of accountability uh, is possible uh, when an algorithm is used for government actions? Um, uh, that, 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 that was the case in, in Italy last year in some uh, decisions that related to the allocation of professors in the university system. That is the case going on right now in the UK uh, with regard to uh, certain exams uh, that uh, are important. Well, well, I'm not going to get into that, but they, but that are, that are important uh, for 
uh, how students evolve in their, uh, in, their, in their education, in their careers. And, uh, in, and the underlying problem is always uh, how to understand an algorithm, how to understand uh, uh, um, how, how, how the government is dealing with data in using data for decision making. And that, in a way, is the same problem we have in dispute resolution. How we, how, how, how can we understand um, the way an algorithm supports decision making, uh, supports um, um, the, uh, uh, an expert uh, examination of, of issues, um, uh, uh, and to what extent we can uh, rely on something that we may not be able to understand fully. And uh, to help us with uh, some of these issues, I'm very happy to have here uh, with us uh, Sophie Nappert, uh, Dr. Paresh Katrani, uh, Damien Crocker, and Carmen uh, Sphere, uh, whom I will uh, introduce as we, as we progress. Uh, um, we uh, we, uh, we have structured uh, this webinar in a way that uh, we will first have um, some, some initial presentations by our speakers. And uh, um, I, I, as, we, as we move on, uh, there will be some time for a Q&A with, uh, with the audience or for some comments within the panel. And um, I would um, encourage all of you to make your comments or ask your questions through the chat or Q&A uh, systems here on the webinar, or as you know, we are also live on YouTube and you can use the chat um, uh, mechanism there for those comments. Um, I would like then moving on with our program here uh, to introduce you, uh, introduce you Sophie Nappert. Sophie uh, is an arbitrator uh, in, uh, with an independent practice based in, uh, in London. Uh, she uh, is trained in uh, dual systems. She is originally a Canadian. Uh, she has uh, she had her education at McGill, uh, who uh, which is famous for precisely for uh, this uh, dual uh, uh, system. And uh, or I, I'm not going to uh, try to put so, too much pressure on Sophie, but she in 2016 won the GAR uh, Award for Best Speech. And uh, she was also uh, nominated for uh, the, uh, uh, she was short shortlisted for the best speech in 2019, precisely about uh, disruption in, in technology. Uh, she, she's going to talk with us about uh, something that's uh, extremely uh, up to date, which is decentralized justice uh, and blockchain arbitration. Uh, Sophie. Thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cesar. And indeed, thank you to the uh, Chartered Institute Brazil branch for, uh, for having me and congratulations on the timeliness um, of this topic, very important topic. I'm going to share my screen because I have um, a few slides um, to show you just to illustrate what I'm going to say. Just one second. Um, let me go back. There we go. Uh, there we go. So uh, I'm going to talk about an emerging phenomenon. Uh, it is the phenomenon uh, that is so-called decentralized justice. It takes place on the blockchain. It is, in a few words, uh, it is the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decision of uh, low value, high volume, mostly e-commerce disputes. But uh, it is, it is put forward by its creators as a, a potential uh, alternative uh, for bigger disputes. Um, it is very much, although it's very much uh, um, in its inception, it is, an, it is a phenomenon that's working. This is not a project. This is something that's going on right now uh, on the blockchain. Uh, the disputes that are being um, addressed in this way are mostly crypto related, but uh, as I will explain, uh, there is um, 
at the moment that these um, these startups are looking are being funded and are looking at scaling up to mainstream uh, users and commercial disputes. So this is something that is worth looking at uh, in my submission uh, for anyone in interested in arbitration as a um, as something important. My personal angle on the technology front, uh, be it AI or blockchain. Um, has always been and remains be, uh, as an arbitrator and as a practitioner, how, what is the place of the human mind uh, alongside technology? And how do you, as a human decision maker or as counsel, how do you partner up with technology to make the arbitration process better, more efficient, less costly, more responsive to users' needs. That's very much the angle that I look at. Now, it may well be that decentralized justice uh, could be a partner as opposed to a rival. And that's what I would like to explore with you. Um, blockchain, first of all, is a technology, as you know. It is the distributed ledger technology and it automatizes certain transactions by uh, way of smart contracts. Uh, just by way of um, a reminder, um, and obviously my panelists know all about this, but for those of you perhaps who uh, are less familiar with it, it was created and rolled out initially to coincide with the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2008. And there was a resulting distrust in big finance. And so it was rolled out as a network of peer-to-peer -peer direct financial trades for cryptocurrency, the most well-known of which is Bitcoin. And these trades, these transactions are hosted on thousands or millions of computers simultaneously. Hence, the, what they call the, um, the fact that it is completely distributed, it is not centralized, it doesn't have an authority, it doesn't have a keeper. Everyone keeps um, a, an identical copy of the transaction simultaneously. Blockchain is premised on the core principle of no central authority, no central database, free of transaction costs. Obviously, participation in it requires uh, an investment in, in hardware, but you don't pay once you're on to transact. And it's open to anyone, and it is not owned by any single entity. That is the premise. There are, of course, nuances on top of that. You can have more private blockchain, but the original thinking was very much that. But, and that's the tool. So you can make, make it do whatever you need it to do. And for the moment, it's got a fairly, I wouldn't say mainstream, but a fairly well-known and accepted use case in the financial sector. And that we're going to look at um, uh, in this presentation at um, the justice sector for it. What fascinates me about blockchain is that it's more than a tool. It is an instrument for social revolution. And it is the social movement aspect of blockchain that is a direct disruption to arbitration and, by, and to state courts, uh, for that matter, in the form of what has come to be known as decentralized or peer-to-peer -peer justice. And these developments of decentralized justice require that as lawyers, we turn on their heads fundamental societal pillars, such, such as what constitutes justice? Who should dispense it? Who we should trust at dispute, as dispute resolvers? Do we, do we trust a, a limited number of arbitrators who have all been trained in the same manner, roughly, or are thinking in the same way? Or do we trust our peers? And do we trust a centralized institution, which in certain countries may not be independent from governmental power? Or do we trust a network of individuals? Is the monetary incentivization of decision makers to come to a consensus decision, which is the way that these decentralized justice systems work, is that compatible with the concept of fairness in dispute resolution? So these are the questions, at, you know, these are huge questions and they are at the center of this emerging um, System. Now, I will come to um, Kleros. Now, there are a few players in this space, 
a few startups. Kleros is one of them. It is the one that I know best. And so I'm going to talk about it. It's also the, the, more, the, the, uh, the, the reason why I chose it for an example is because it's probably the most purest about uh, the decentralization of its model. Uh, for the time being, anyway, we'll see. We'll see how that uh, where that goes. But for, so it's, it's, it, it applies a very um, pure ethos of uh, decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer justice. There are uh, Kleros has competitors. One of them is called Jur J U R, which um, operates a little more. Um, First of all, it's got more lawyers behind it, and you can you can see that it has more concern about enforcement of the decisions in the real world, off chain, for example. Uh, but Kleros, for the moment, uh, is uh, is very much taking place on chain, and it's an application for the resolution of disputes that is sitting on the Ethereum blockchain, and it allows randomly selected stakeholders in the blockchain. The, what Kleros calls jurors, as you can see uh, on, on the illustration, to pass judgment on smart contract disagreements according to a coded matrix of predetermined outcomes and in accordance with a system whereby the jurors are financially incentivized to come to a consensus decision. And those jurors who do not come or, or agree with the majority are financially penalized. That's how, according to Kleros, you incentivize complete random strangers into being fair and being um, just. The decisions uh, rendered by that panel may be appealed, and they may be appealed not only by the disputing parties, but also by the other jurors, those who were dissenters and who feel that ultimately an appeal court would agree with them and they will be in the end, uh, financially rewarded. That is the system that Kleros calls decentralized justice and it calls its process arbitration. Earlier this year, uh, Kleros was granted just under 800,000 euros by uh, a public investment bank in France, a state entity, to launch a project called Project Themis, which aims at making Kleros intelligible and usable by mainstream corporate and institutional customers. And the brief includes uh, obviously a technological angle, but also very much a legal angle that looks at the alignment of the protocol with arbitration law and procedure. And it's part, um, as, uh, by way of context, it's part of a, a global effort by France to offer blockchain-based solutions for enterprises. So this is something that is being, as I was saying, um, encourage and invest in it. So from this perspective, it's a very clever combination of crowdsourcing, blockchain technology, and game theory. The creators of Kleros say the following in their white paper. Every step of the arbitration process, securing evidence, selecting jurors, is fully automated. Kleros does not rely on the honesty of a few individuals, such as yours truly, but on game theoretical economic incentives. Cryptocurrencies are helping millions achieve financial inclusion. Clarus will do the same in access to justice by developing a justice system that produces true decisions in a secure and inexpensive way. Just as Bitcoin brought banking for the unbanked, Clarus has the potential to bring justice for the unjustice. Now, here by way of context, I should say, that one of the uh, Clarus co-founders, uh, someone called Dr. Federico Ast, is uh, hails from Argentina. And he, I think one of the things uh, that uh, really spurred his, um, his uh, idea for Clarus was the fact that he felt that his country's legal system was failing um, small and medium enterprises and individuals and, and the access to justice for him uh, and the distrust of uh, his peers and countrymen in their justice system was a, a huge part uh, of, uh, of his decision. So in looking at those uh, emerging startups in decentralized justice, um, I think it's quite important for someone like me sitting in London, hailing from Canada, having the luxury of a justice system that works to realize that not everywhere has that luxury. And so therefore it may make a lot of sense um, to tweak the justice system centralized as we know it into something that people might have access to and trust. We're not there yet, but that's the idea. 
So this is, of course, a system that offers unmatched low cost, unmatched security, and unmatched speed. A Claire's jurors, a Claire's juror has said that his time on deciding a given dispute varies between five minutes and four hours. Of course, these are binary disputes, you know, pay the claimant, don't pay the claimant. They're quite simple, but they are one of the parts of Project Themis that uh, they're doing with the French uh, investment is to explore more complex disputes. Um, perhaps also for a generation that puts a premium on likes and influencers, the common sense input of dozens or hundreds of people who come to be see, will come to be seen as significant and much, much more valuable than uh, the musings of uh, one or three arbitrators who are perceived as being detached from uh, the real world. Now, there is a lot in the underpinnings of the decentralized justice model that set off very loud fire alarms uh, in the ears of any disputes lawyer. The Clara system relies heavily on game theory and game theory is a study of mathematical models of strategic interaction amongst what are premised as rational decision makers who do not have to trust each other or know each other and who will converge on a given decision for the primary purpose, and that's important, of maximizing financial gain. So in simple terms, Claros jurors are told that they will make money if they decide according to the choices that everyone thinks everybody else will choose, and they will lose money if they don't. Now, it is true that it, this serves a real need of access to dispute resolution in the era of e-commerce, where you need an immediacy and a speed of decision-making that just is not present. And these disputes just go completely under the radar of a court system, even small claims, or, um, or arbitration as we know it. So there's no, there's no question that there is a need there, but however, in, go, in, in developing their, their, uh, their concept, Kleros, in my view, takes some liberties with concepts that underpin democratic society's current understanding and constructive justice. Kleros tries to equate gain theoretical underpinnings of consensus with concepts of honesty, with concepts of fairness, with concepts of even handedness. And in my view, that can be misleading. And I'm, I'm in dialogue with them about, about these, these areas. So I, I find it quite interesting to see how their mind works and hopefully vice versa, they can see how a, lawyer mind, a, lawyer, a lawyer's mind works. Claros champions the form of private justice that is centered on the maximization of economic gain rather than fairness by saying that the two usually coincide. Now, to my knowledge, there's been just over 300 cases decided on Claros as we speak. And so I'm not sure that statistically we can say that fairness and game theory are the same thing just yet, but that's, that's, the, um, that's how they, uh, they proceed. Claros encourages also, and I think that personally, I think that's a big problem. I'd be very happy to hear my co-panelists view on this. Claros encourages, encourages what I call the uh, objectivization of justice for private gain. So what's at the center of the process is no longer the party's dispute. In fact, the parties lose control of the process for the moment that they press go to Claros with my dispute. They have no say in jury selection, which is done by an algorithm. They can put in evidence, but so can everyone else because it's all public on the blockchain. And they can also um, appeal, but so can all the jurors. So they pretty much lose control of their disputes and the core motivation of jurors in arriving at the decision is how much can I make out of this? Personally, even trying my best, putting an access to justice prison, I find that's a high price to pay um, and, and has the potential to veer off course quite, uh, quite dangerously, unless you have some governance or checks and balances that ju are just not there at the moment. And that I, I have no doubt will end up being there, but it's, a, it's important to flag this at, 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 this, uh, at this stage. Finally, of course, uh, another big question is the interaction of this ecosystem with the rest of the world for enforcement purposes off chain uh, and, uh, and the applicability 
of the New York Convention. So I've prepared a little slide that looks more specifically at some of the tension points. Very, I mean, I'm sure there are many more, but those that I, I find glaring. And where I think um, a path for the future would be to try to align what Claros is proposing and its model of you know, inexpensive, quick, immediate e-commerce driven uh, model with the more uh, important aspect of fairness and, uh, uh, and uh, the optical process. I, I, so I've done a, a little comparative table. Um, the random selection of jurors, Clara says, ensures impartiality because we don't know who they are. They are anonymized. Uh, they're randomly chosen. I mean, they are randomly chosen amongst a group who self-select by putting money on the table and saying that money means that I, I'm ready to be cast as a juror. It's a little bit as if I were paying to be on an arbitrator's list. Um, there, there are questions to my mind here uh, on the, uh, not only the fact that the parties have no choice, but uh, the diversity of tribunals is a big question mark at the moment. I'm willing to, I don't know this for sure, but I, seeing uh, the way that I've, I've been interacting with the Clarice community, I'm quite sure that 99.9% .9 of these jurors are male and white, um, which maybe for crypto disputes doesn't make a difference. But again, if you were thinking of scaling up, there are questions there to be asked. Um, the maximizing payoff as the center of justice um, versus resolving conflict and the peaceful uh, oiling of e-commerce wheels. It may be that the two coincide, but I, to my mind, um, the, the, the monetization of justice in that way uh, I find um, needs some checks and balances that and governance that should be there uh, eventually. Um, I struggle with seeing fairness uh, and the place of fairness in incentivized consensus. Um, I struggle in seeing the place of legal reasoning in incentivized consensus. For the time being, there's no law involved in Claro's disputes, but again, if they're scaling up, that's going to change. And finally, there's the question of precedent. So blockchain is immutable. Anything that goes on there stays on there, um, pretty much. That's the idea anyway. So a lot of those disputes, um, the results of those disputes will find themselves as an immutable precedent on the blockchain. So taking that logic a bit further, you could see at one point a certain type of dispute having a jurisprudence of precedent that would mean that you would already know what, uh, what the jurors would decide in that certain type of disputes. And so that in a way would almost shoot the model in the foot. Um, whereas in arbitration, obviously the precedent can be more flexible. Uh, we don't even have precedent. It is more uh, past decisions. They have very uh, only influential value. So, and the question of precedent I know is something that the Claros um, developers are looking at uh, in, their, in their scaling up uh, model. To finish, um, this is um, a spectrum that uh, I've developed with Federico Ast to try to see at the moment where uh, decentralized justice might work uh, on, the, on, on the justice landscape. Now, one of the biggest, um, I would say, nemeses of Kleros is artificial intelligence, because obviously, for the moment, they rely on good old human judgment uh, to make their decision. But it may well be that those, some of those disputes will be easily uh, in the future decided by, uh, by artificial intelligence. Now, from the Claros perspective, uh, that is a development that might occur. They see themselves a position one rung over that in the center. And then they recognize, of course, that there will be always um, the very high highly um, complex, uh, high stakes uh, disputes that are going to remain suited to international operation as we know it. Again, from my prism of partner partnering and, and finding a space alongside each other so that we make um, the dispute resolution landscape more accessible to more people, maybe that's one thing to aim for. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, Sophie. Um, that, that's very interesting. What uh, the point you made about, uh, well, uh, among many other interesting points uh, about this, uh, about the fact 
that artificial intelligence may be an enemy of uh, Claros. And uh, in, in, in a way, it gives Claros a human aspect, right? Because- Completely. Uh, you, yeah. Completely, they are, they are, and they, it's very important to them. And uh, the human aspect is, is I would say, sixty percent of what Claros is, because uh, the community aspect is extremely important. They do everything; the whole development is put to the vote. It's extremely democratic. So, and of, obviously, the decision making as well. Yes, yeah. I would say, yeah. I would say, if anything, um, it's, <laughs> and it's an interesting question, perhaps for our, our ethicist on the panel. Uh, to what extent uh, financial motivation as a core goes against human nature uh, is something that I uh, that I find a very interesting question. Yeah, but, but, but it's, uh, it's it's interesting because uh, the the financial motivation is um, is linked to an a, an assessment of what the other humans involved in the process will decide, right? So uh, so you. Uh, so you sometimes you, 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 in a way you need to project what other humans will decide under their analysis of the case, so that you will be financially uh, rewarded. Rewarded. And, That's right. And, uh, it's so, called the shelling yeah. point. Yeah. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, thank you. And uh, well, so now we move precisely to Dr. Paresh Katreni, uh, who is probably well known to many of, of, uh, of you in, in our audience as the director of education and training at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in London. Uh, but he is also, oh, he, he was a, a, a senior lecturer uh, at the University of Westminster, precisely uh, dealing uh, in research uh, with issues involving artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, and uh, ethics. Uh, in, in his uh, view on the issues that we are discussing today is related to how legal tech is changing the profession of law and uh, what that means from an ethical perspective, including uh, what we can expect in the legal uh, landscape uh, ahead of, of us in terms of technology and ethics. So Dr. P uh, Paresh uh, Katreni, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Cesar, for a very um, kind introduction and also to the um, CIR Brazilian branch for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm very grateful to Sophie for introducing the human element um, into the equation because um, there's an element, I think there's an important element that we really can't talk about technology without acknowledging the human element within it because ultimately the law, justice, are essentially about what it means to be, what it means to think, what it means to feel, what, it, what the perceptions of right, wrong, fair, just. These are all subjective, subjective um, terms, which we as humans, of course, um, import our humanity in answering those questions. And I guess in talking about the ethical issues that technology gives rise to in dispute resolution, I take a very philosophical approach um, in addressing ethics. I don't take a black letter or a prescriptive approach in looking at ethics. Um, my, my work is hugely philosophical. And to kind of give you the context for that, um, it kind of stems from my, from my PhD research. I'll say a few words on it, because I think that will be a good uh, sort of frame for, for what will follow in my talk. So uh, my PhD was on refugee law. Um, I worked with refugees um, for a number of years, um, helping them with their human rights and asylum applications. Um, and must have helped about 2,000 asylum seekers. And during that time, I often thought to myself, well, we have the Refugee Convention, we have international law, we have all the, what the, what the, what the laws say, and, but, but the way in which they are implied to, to asylum seekers, it's, it's often quite prescriptive, quite black letter, can, or can be quite dry quite mechanical in its application. And it made me think to myself, well, what is there, but what is the law? What is there about the law that makes people take a different inter different approach to it? And of course, giving rise, to, well, what is the law? There is no one right answer. Jurisprudence tells us it's natural law, it's positive law, it's critical legal theory. There are many different interpretations of what the law is. Actually, in the end, in my PhD research, 
they ended up looking at um, international refugee law from an existential ontological perspective that, you know, you might, you know like Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, uh, I don't want to go too deep into philosophy here, but he talks about in his lectures that um, it's it, existence precedes essence, that first of all, we exist as human beings and then we come to define what the world means to us, as opposed to essence defining our existence. There is no rule book out there that tells us what's the right way to act. So when it comes to asylum seekers, for example, um, really, the law may tell us one thing, but it doesn't mean that we lose our humanity. And ultimately, when it comes to the law, it's important for us to um, take a human approach. And I and so um, what my research brought home to me was that in approaching ethics and and and, and, and the law, it's not just about what the rules say. It's also important to kind of bring it down to its common denominator, which is that the law is about humans. When, we walk, when, when, when a client talks to a lawyer, it's not just a client-lawyer relationship, it's a human-human relationship. When two lawyers, two, two parties before an arbitration are talking to each other, it's not just about, um, about you know, what, what the law says it is, it's about legal argumentation, it's about thinking, it's about feeling, it's about saying what you feel is right or wrong in a particular situation, of course, I mean, case strategy, but it's also about human interaction. And um, so when it comes to ethics, professional, there are certain concepts, certain philosophical concepts which are important and which kind of are become more pertinent when we come to look at technology. Professionalism is an important ethical concept. Of course, what is professionalism? It's the idea that somebody goes to, goes for, goes to university, goes for training, becomes highly skilled at something, and then is trusted enough by a client who may lack those skills to be able to act in their best interests. Underpinning that is the human notion of trust, that one goes to a lawyer, one goes to a, an expert, a professional, because they trust that the, the individual in question will act in their best interests and will do what is necessary for them in that, in that particular case to ensure that they get the best outcome possible based upon the facts of a case. Confidentiality is important, that, we, that the, the client can trust from an ethical perspective, their lawyer to keep their confidence, of course, confidentiality is, is the bedrock of the, of the client-lawyer relationship. It, uh, it's important that the client can trust the lawyer. So, but what overpins all this, what we find in, in ethical codes around the world is of course, the notion of the best interest of the client. That it's fundamental, it's the primary, probably the overriding duty of, of, a, of a lawyer to act in the best interest of the client. And, which, which gives rise to questions, well, what's best, what's interests? And you see where I'm going with this. The question I'm seeking to answer is, can a machine do best interests? Does the notion of best interest of a client require that thinking, feeling, acting, doing, human agent that is able to look at the client's case, look at the world and determine what's best based on intuition? And can a machine actually do that? is the ultimate thesis that I wish to interrogate. That's why I approach it from a, that's why I think that uh, approaching it from a philosophical perspective, technology, it's, it's a crucial thing. And I think this was, this, this, you can see the undercurrents of this in Sophie's talk, for example, when she was talking about um, things like fairness, justice, decentralized justice and so forth. So when a, when a client goes to the lawyer, they trust them to be able to dis dispense or discharge their legal services in the most effective way that they'll essentially listen to them, they'll take their information, they'll do the appropriate research, they'll analyze the case from all perspectives and use their intuition and use the case strategy to ultimately advise the client in, in their best interests. So what, is, what does technology do? Technology, we've heard it before, acts as a disruptor in this relationship. It acts as a go, it comes in the middle of the human client, human lawyer, and disrupts that relationship in a number of different ways. And it's important to interrogate that disruption from an ethical perspective in my, in my mind. Technology, of course, comes in many different sizes and shapes. We have non-artificial intelligence related technologies, standard things like email, case management systems, video conferencing don't have any artificial intelligence involved, but yet they, of course, are technology that disrupt the, I use disruption not in a negative connotation, but they come in and they, of course, change the legal landscape. And they, they certainly they influence the, the client lawyer relationship. One thinks back to 40, 50 years ago, um, it, before email came along. 
something as simple as that. A client wanted some legal advice to go to the lawyer, look them in the look them in the face, have a conversation with them in the office, and it'll be a very close relationship. And there's of course there's tr- loads of studies that have been done on just how face to face contact engenders trust and engenders uh, a feeling of security between the people that are talking to each other. The question because comes to something like email engender the same sort of um, same sort of trust. I mean that. And a contemporary twist on that, of course, is virtual virtual hearings. Of course, in lockdown, we need to think of innovative ways in which to carry on with work as usual. And the virtual conferences and virtual arbitrations and virtual hearings are, of course, a godsend virtual training, for example. But you know, if you look at think of someone like uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who talks about the body. I mean, there's studies that have been done real studies that have been done that show that the absence of the the human body the absence of the person before you does have does have some influence on the on the relationship between people um and therefore you know even even something as simple as email if you go back to 20 30 years ago you know from an evolutionary perspective certainly email has been absolutely wonderful for us but what has it done to the relationship of trust between um, between humans when it comes to the ethical side of things are, are things which are important for us to consider. But I'll, I'll say a few words on artificial intelligence. I mean, artificial intelligence is a very broad category. I mean, uh, um, within it, one subset of artificial intelligence, of course, is machine learning. That you know, training training machines, training algorithms to basically work work to huge, massive data sets to kind of whether that be um, reinforced learning, whether that be supervised or unsupervised learning. That the machine can essentially look at these these huge amounts of these huge amounts of data and spot those patterns and ultimately work out different predictions and different pa- based upon different patterns within the data. Um, to give you an example, I, I worked on a, on a project funded when I was at university, funded by the European Union, where we um, crunched through large numbers of, of, of uh, family law and employment law cases, more than 100,000 cases, in order to create a chatbot system where somebody could telephone a, a machine speak in natural language to the machine and the machine could then decipher what uh, the case was about, triage the case, and then send over the case file to a lawyer with the triaging already done and thereby save on cost and save on time because the lawyer would have it in. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, crunching for huge data sets in order to spot those patterns that you know can enable legal services to be discharged. And of course there are efficiencies and cost savings and time savings and lots of lots of positives to artificial intelligence. But what are the key ethical questions? And I keep going back to this point that um, machines are disrupting the human relationship between people. Whether you approach it from a justice perspective and say, well, look, the, the basis of the legal system is just to, to ensure that fairness, to ensure that the, the outcome between two parties is just, it's fair, it's right. Look at those terms, just, fair, and right. In and of themselves, they are hugely subjective. Go back to Sophie's chart. There's, there are some cases that do not lend themselves to artificial intelligence because they are, by their very definition, complex, and they involve, they, they turn upon human concepts of right, wrong, fair, just, et cetera. Can a machine do that? Can an algorithm be trained to do that? So, I mean, I I cannot see any way in which the question of technology can be approached from an ethical perspective that doesn't take into account key philosophical, key subjective, key psychological questions, which only, which to some extent humans can answer. So, So, I mean, technology, even something as simple as intuition, we, I mean, you're a lawyer, there's other lawyers on the panel. Think about when a client comes to you and they and you, you talk to them, you listen to them, and they, they walk away, you're thinking about their case. What is it that you rely upon in order to ensure that you act in your client's best interest? It's that gut feeling that you have. The intuition, which your years of legal experience and training has taught you, is the right thing, the proper way to, in which to take this case forward. Intuition is fundamental. Chatbots have a place. Legal research platforms where you speak into a machine and say, here are the facts of my case. And the machine says, oh, go away, look at this case, has their place. 
predictive analytical systems where you know the, the systems take huge amounts of data on judge on how judges decide cases on how parties prosecute cases in order to spot the ways in which cases are likely to go have their place but the question becomes in a world where which we are now talking about robot lawyers robot lawyer has become common parlance in in, in, in some circles uh, robot judges for example and this is we're kind of moving towards things becoming a lot more automated what does that do to intuition what does that do to the best interests of the, of the client? Can we trust the machine? It's a ethical question number one. Can we? Can lawyering, which is based upon professional professionalism, going to university, learning skills, years of experience, etc., intuition, can that be done effectively by a machine, or are there things that cannot be done by machines? And I kind of I, I really like Sophie's slide about the, her last slide about you know, the complexity versus the, the more straightforward objective, smaller, smaller cases. Um, what does that mean for, I mean, as an educationist, what does that mean for legal education? I mean, now law schools, you know, law schools have traditionally taught legal, you know, certain legal skills, um, taking, taking instructions, legal research, drafting, advocacy, etc. What does that mean for the law school curriculum of the future um, when it comes to, to kind of training uh, the lawyers of tomorrow? Is it fundamental that, that you know, law schools start adopting um, legal technology into their curricula in order to ensure that we're training lawyers effectively given what's coming down the road? Um, I said before, uh, artificial intelligence rests upon big data, big data sets. Any less than, anything less than big data sets that undermines the integrity of the system. But, how do we ensure that the data that we're relying is ultimately the best data, the best quality data that we can get? I mean, you can never be 100%, you can never have all the data in the world. How can you ensure from an ethical viewpoint that the data that, you're, that you know, people are training algorithms to are, is ultimately the, most, is the best data possible in training the algorithm, which is even more fundamental because with technology comes this perception of neutrality. People, when we're talking to other humans, we know that they, we know, we know they have their, they have their interests. We know they have their biases, their favorites, their likes and their dislikes. But we often fall into the trap of thinking, well, the machines are, you know, they're not humans. I mean, they, they don't. They're, they're objective. They're neutral. They don't have any. They don't have any sort of um, any particular interest in, in a decision. So therefore, we can trust the machine. Can we? How, it goes back to the question of bias, of course. How do we know that the, the data sets on which the machines have been trained are the, the most optimal, the best data sets possible, and that bias hasn't crept in in, in basically putting that, that, that piece of kit together and there's different forms of bias that can creep in. And so can we actually, tr whose justice is it? Is it the machine's justice or is it the programmer's justice? And that gives rise to yet another question. Who, who or what is a lawyer of tomorrow? Lawyers, by the are a highly regulated, it's a highly regulated profession. Lawyering, uh, the legal profession, it has like doctors. Given that that lawyers are acting in the public interest or act, seeking to act in the interest of those who might be vulnerable, legal profession is highly regulated. To what extent? How do we regulate those who basically put together the algorithms and put together the machines? I mean, do they? Do we now say that they come within the legal codes to which lawyers are have traditionally or are subject to? What regulatory code applies to, to those people that are putting together these algorithms? Are, is it lawyering by proxy? Are, do we have a situation where people are essentially circumventing what it takes to be circumventing legal regulation by being lawyers in everything but name? So what sort of regulatory questions does it, do we have to consider when it comes to essentially asking ourselves, well, who is the lawyer? Is the lawyer the programmer? Is the lawyer the machine? Or is the lawyer the human person who's essentially interfacing with that machine in, in basically um, in sort of taking that particular case forward? Black box, the black box phenomena is obviously a very, it's a very important thing which needs to be considered. To what it, so you have these algorithms, these, these pieces, these um, artificial intelligence based systems, which are making decisions that are absolutely fundamental to some people. 
but to what extent should we be allowed to kind of go in and unpick um, the, these algorithms and see, well, on what basis have they made these decisions? Of course, it gives rise to, to issues around intellectual property. You know, you have, have companies that have invested that hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in putting together these algorithms and, and these pieces of, you know, these pieces of software who might not wish their, 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 their work to be unpicked in a court of law or for somebody to go in and understand the code, the code, you know. So therefore, we have a situation where the, the, the black box where they said no, we're not going to let people go in and kind of unpick. And, and so to what extent does it lend itself to, to challenge and to basically um, for us to be able to understand the basis of a decision. And one or two, I'll end with one or two final points. Because there's a whole raft of ethical issues we could consider here. Access to justice is important. Um, I think we are now on the road towards greater automation in, in, um, in, in legal, legal services. And, um, and if anything, the lockdown and the pandemic has accelerated that. I, still, I think we'll see innovation, mass, massive innovation over the next few years. And there'll be a rush to kind of automate things. But with, as we gradually move to online, online provision of legal services, does that facilitate access to justice for those who, for example, might not be technology literate or who might not have access to the internet or broadband or machines that they ultimately need in order to access those services? I've spoken to people who, you know, who often public services delivered by local authorities are, are put onto online platforms, but yet they are not literate enough to be able to understand how those systems work. So what do you, what the technology literacy, what, so what does that do in terms of access to justice and indeed the rule of law, if, if more things are moved online? And to, so that's, a key, that's another question that needs to be considered kind of going forward. So no doubt there are, technology has its benefits. It has its benefits in terms of, it, it does promote access to justice, it's a double-edged sword, it does. It also does lead to efficiencies, it leads, it arguably leads in some cases to a better quality of decision making. But going back to what I started with at the beginning, which is that um, notions, the, the, the basic tenets that underlie the legal system, just, right, fair, wrong, etc., are based upon human intuition, subjective feelings, which human beings are of course best placed to do. Can machines replicate that and do that in the same way? Or are we looking at a different type of justice? Have we reached a stage where we're essentially comparing apples and oranges? What we're saying is that um, we, when it comes to machines, we should, not be, be, we should not be judging them by human notions of justice, but we should be judging them by machine notions of justice. So therefore what we need is an entirely new branch of jurisprudence, um, which takes into account those ethical, and those technological issues when it comes to the field of ethics. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paresh. Uh, well, those are very, very complex uh, issues, and I, uh, I the, um, uh, it, it, it could be, uh, it could be simpler if we could make a decision like, uh, okay, let's forget about technology, and uh, th th that's too dangerous. Uh, let's not go into there. Uh, in, to, uh, in let's go back to our, the old ways. It seems, uh, and I think we, we would all agree uh, on that, it seems impossible to make that decision at this stage, right? So it's uh, crucial that we, we understand the uh, limits and in, in, in challenges of technology. And um, we, um, I think this um, A level, exams uh, confusion that's going on right now in the, at, at least uh, it seems to be going on right now in the UK, uh, is a very interesting illustration of, 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 of that, uh, of those problems, right? Because uh, basically, if I understand it correctly, uh, in, due to the pandemic, it was impossible for the government to conduct the usual exams, uh, physical exams that were, were necessary. So an algorithm was put in place to um, re replace the results of those uh, exams and to, you know, in a way, emulate what those results would be. Uh, but it seems that there was also some human interference with the with the 
uh, outcome of the of the the use of those algorithms so that there was you know a, a, a sort of human correction to to the use of the algorithm which may be also at the bottom of the problem right because uh, you uh, you create an algorithm allegedly to uh, replicate what uh, what should be the expected uh, outcome of exams, but on the other hand, you, based on human intuition, you say no, no, no. Let, let's not use the algorithm algorithm all the way. Let's give it a human correction, and then you may end up with a with a result that's not human and it's not algorithm. It's uh, something in between that, that doesn't make anybody happy. And so, uh, yeah, those, uh, those are very complex, complex things uh, that we, we, we need to uh, tackle as we move on. Uh, now, um, following our program here, uh, we will uh, hear um, uh, Damien, uh, who, who comes uh, with, a, with, a, with, in a way, with a different uh, point of view. Uh, Damien Crocker is, uh, is an arbitrator. He's the chair of the um, uh, Western Counties branch in the UK, but also he's an entrepreneur. Uh, he, he is the founder of uh, ODR Plat, uh, which is a company that provides uh, online dispute resolution services. Uh, and uh, as you will tell you, as he will tell you, um, uh, based on a very interesting um, assumption that ODR uh, pro uh, uh, allows for greener dispute resolution and uh, has a, an aspect of sustainability uh, that uh, should be especially encouraged. And so, uh, well, I'm, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, giving the floor to David uh, for his presentation. David, please. Thank you, Caesar, and thank you to the Brazil branch for inviting me to talk. Uh, it's a great opportunity. I'm just going to share my, my screen and uh, wreck all my credibility uh, with technology. No, I will, won't. Fine. Okay, so look, um, yes, yeah, slightly different uh, uh, discussion now. I promise that for the next 20 minutes, um, there'll be no mention of blockchain or AI. Um, so, uh, if, you, if that's your topic, you can go and make yourself a cup of tea. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about ODR and about the um, uh, about uh, a little bit about um, ODR Plat, a uh, quick advert, and then we'll talk about issues related to ODR. It's not all perfect, um, so best practice. And then a little bit about uh, its carbon footprint. Um, it's not as green as you might think. Hey, um, ODR Plat uh, is, a, is an integrated case management and video conferencing platform, uh, which uh, is, uh, is secure and also low cost. Um, we are actually the first carbon neutral ODR platform provider in the world. So uh, we, we've uh, got that first. I'm sure there'll be a, that won't be far behind. Um, so I'm going to talk, um, uh, I'm going to just uh, mention to you a moment about um, OGR Plat in Brazil. Actually, Brazil has played a key part in, in the business, and I thought it would be interesting little note. Um, so we, we were actually um, uh, founded in a, over lunch in a, um, a restaurant called uh, Tamakino, which is a fusion of Brazilian and Japanese cuisine, no less. And um, they actually, as a restaurant, uh, it's, it's, uh, we were in Tower Bridge, and those of you who know London, and um, it's quite colourful. Uh, but uh, they actually um, do various philanthropic projects, and uh, one of which is uh, in uh, Rosina, uh, uh, favela in uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro. Um, when we were developing the platform, we actually reached out to various individuals, one of which was Cesar uh, Pereira, um, who has kindly invited us onto the talk, and his input actually was very valuable. And I, I thank you, Isa, for that. Um, then uh, in terms of us becoming carbon neutral, what happens is you, you add up all your carbon emissions and then you have to find a way to offset them. So what we did uh, was um, we um, uh, paid for our emissions 
by offsetting them uh, at a small hydroelectric plant uh, in Portolandia in the state of Mato Grosso. And I apologize for absolutely murdering that um, negotiation uh, in, in Brazil. So another connection, completely random, I have to admit. Um, and then this is our very first webinar as ODR Black. So uh, Brazil is playing a key a part in our in our future. Anyway, that's enough about OGR Plat and a bit more about uh, what we're supposed to be talking about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ODR now um, and then talk about some of the issues related to it. So ODR itself uh, is uh, it's been a while in coming, uh, getting off ground. Um, it's uh, there's a, a guy called Colin Rule who uh, I think was the, the father of of online dispute resolution. Um, and uh, he wrote a book called um, uh, Online Dispute Resolution for Businesses. Um, and he uh, wrote that book and executives at eBay read it and thought, well, oh, that's very interesting and employed him to develop his, uh, their uh, consumer dispute system, uh, which uh, has been very successful. Millions of disputes have been on that platform. Um, really, the consumer side in ODR has been quite popular. On the business side, not not so. Um, uh, Unstitral uh, formed a working group to undertake work in the field of online dispute resolution, and um, they spent seven years talking about it, and then came out with the Unstitral published technical notes in 2017. The fact is, um, there have been some barriers to adopting ODR, and they fall into three categories: technology, human, and legal. I promise not to mention uh, AI or blockchain in the technology section I'm about to discuss. So skills, um, it has actually been alluded to, uh, people don't necessarily have the skills to, to uh, turn on a computer, alone get on the internet. Um, conferencing, the skills to, to use those kind of platforms, sharing their screens, um, getting to turn them off, um, of stories on the internet about people who've realized they're live. Um, internet, internet availability. Um, it was mentioned about that, um, that not everybody has access to the internet actually in, in many parts of the world. Definitely that's the case. Um, businesses in a lot of countries though, the internet now is, is available. Uh, stability of the internet can crash very easily. We have security issues, hacking, um, and Zoom bombing, although Zoom bombing isn't quite what it used to, used to be uh, with the, the work that Zoom has, has done. The, then you've got the human angle, the skills, um, video conferencing etiquette. Um, I know myself uh, when, when I'm on a call, sometimes you uh, don't wait for the other person to finish uh, speaking. You jump in the, uh, and also what, what you wear as well, um, what people have on. Uh, I'm here, sat here now in a, a nice, nice shirt. Um, but uh, many people, when they stand up, uh, forget that not necessarily the shirt is uh, got their boxes on as well. Isn't a great look, uh, but not. That's not true of me though. Um, this visibility issues over body language. Uh, people concerned that uh, when someone's being a, 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 a acting as a witness, you can't necessarily read body language as much as you would like to in a physical hearing. Um, can't see them blush, though I think it's quite easy to see people blush even on um, uh, yeah, conferencing. Uh, coaching as well, is there somebody else in the room beside them? Um, you can't necessarily tell whether someone's sat in a, in a corner away or there's something running up and down, some uh, messaging on the screen telling them how to answer questions. The procedural issues, time zones, uh, the, the norm in arbitration to get on a plane or used to be, at least. Um, uh, now it's scheduling. How do you decide whose time zone takes precedent? Um, play, what was considered at the beginning of the COVID um, period was, was that uh, disputes were delayed. But as people have realized that actually it's going on for some time now, that uh, delay is no, no longer actually uh, an option. And also there was a consideration that online was only really suitable for certain kinds of disputes. And it's legal, party agreement. There's issues over whether uh, one party actually agreed to do things virtually. 
um, you can get around that, of course, by um, uh, the the um, as the African Academic Academy protocol actually talks of there being an agreement, a hearing agreement um, signed, um, is which is a one way of of ensuring that one party doesn't start a challenge challenges to the um, to the award. Um, some issues have been raised about the enforcement of awards, um, whether or not that's, that's uh, achievable. So the seat, how do you know where the seat is? I mean, we're all in cyberspace, so um, is, is that an issue? Not necessarily. And then, as has been mentioned a few times, access to justice. Um, people don't have the internet or the skills, um, they get justice. But then the opposite side of that is um, justice delayed is justice denied, so ODI does have a place. Anyway, what a difference a pandemic can make, because the fact is, those issues uh, that have been raised and reasons why people have been sat on their hands getting ready to do ODR actually have come to very little, because the fact is, there is no choice right now. There is no choice to use online dispute resolution. And uh, as a result, what people have been doing, they've been writing loads of protocols and you can see on my screen, I have a list there, and uh, it's maybe just big enough to read, maybe it's not quite. Oh, in fact, these are just a very small selection of um, protocols that have been written about every possible aspect of online dispute resolution, you know, about the virtual hearing, about uh, witnesses, um, and, uh, and everyone has been writing protocols, every institute, um, charging to arbitrators was mentioned, I've written some good guidelines on various aspects. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a case now of uh, realising that online dispute resolution is here. Um, we do need to think about how to do this um, for the long term. And so lots of documents have been produced to give guidance. And one that um, is currently in, in draft is called the Protocol for Online Case Management international arbitration, a mindful. But it's, uh, it actually fills a gap um, because it's about the technology, technology on which you run your arbitration. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that given this is a talk on technology. Um, it's, um, so the, the, the protocol itself um, was uh, is being developed by a working group, uh, Equal Tech Adoption and International Arbitration. Um, it's got a number of uh, law firms behind it, uh, which you can see there. Um, Robert Smith, Freehill, CMS, Hogan Level, Latham and Watkins, Ashes Wood, Ashes, LA Piper. Um, it's aimed at everyone who takes part in an, in an arbitration, um, from the parties, the legal representatives, and the technology provider themselves. And the purpose of it is it's practical guidance arbitral participants seeking to use an online case management platform. So it helps you choose a platform um, that you might use and think about what that platform might be in its selection. Um, and actually, you can make comments on it until 31st of August. Um, there's, hopefully, there's a link there. Um, and um, if you're a few days over, I think they'll get over it. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely worth a read. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about it now. Basically, the, uh, there's a heading desirable characteristics and functionality of a platform. Uh, these are some of the elements. Um, shared documents. Benefit there is that you can have a, a document all in one place, uh, rather than having it scattered in different versions on it's the same document for everybody in the same place, which makes a lot of sense. Secure communication. Instead of communicating via email, you communicate on the platform. Strangely enough, Everything is not in English. Everybody doesn't speak English, um, which is an, an English speaker only. And I find that very, very unusual. Um, that is the case. The world speaks lots of languages. And so the interface should cover that so that a dispute um, can be carried out in various languages. Single login. Um, the, the, the login is unique to the user. It's permission based so that they can uh, only access the, the hearing room they can only access certain documents. Um, and so it's very specific. Uh, data storage, um, we, we live in an age of um, data protection laws, uh, which uh, can, can change overnight, um, as happened recently. Um, 
and uh, so where you store your, your, your information can be very important uh, and that should be an option. Uh, the document should be deletable um, the, um, by agreement with the parties, um, but in some countries, um, in, in Latin America, for example, um, the documents have to be kept for a very long period of time, as in other countries should be deleted immediately after the arbitration. So there needs to be that level of flexibility on, on the platform. Integrated secure video conferencing, other than having your all your documents in one place and then having to bolt on then um, another uh, video conferencing solution. Um, the, the ideal would be to have it all on, on the same platform. Um, bundling, have your documents on the, um, the platform. Now, uh, it'd be great to be able to then just um, press a button and have a bundle created so that uh, you're not um, putting out and sticking it all together. Um, other thing to consider, uh, and it's, it's part of, of the protocol, is uh, environment and sustainability. Um, this, uh, this is a, an area that uh, ODR Platt is uh, very keen on, um, and, and actually they emphasize the, uh, in the protocol, integration, uh, integrated secure video conferencing and e-bundling as, as part of that. Um, another area which um, I think uh, all institutes should, should think about, institutions in particular, um, is, um, is, the, is making um, climate offsetting recoverable cost in arbitration. Um, this would uh, which certainly, I think, uh, encourage encourage use of, of offsetting in, in, in disputes. And of course, I'm talking about arbitration. These are things that could apply to court, um, online courts, and, and also in, in mediations as well. So online actually does not necessarily equal green. Um, data centers, are predicted to produce more CO2 emissions than aviation by 2025. Email, if you send 20 emails a day for a year, that's 78 grams CO2 emissions. Not much, you say. For a law firm of 100 lawyers, that's 7.8 tons of CO2 emissions. Your mobile phone, use it one hour a day per year, that's 1.25 tons of CO2 emissions. That's, that's that's a lot. So, uh, line helps. Stops you getting on a plane. Flight from New York to Rio de Janeiro, business class, that's 3.3 tons of CO2 emissions. 10 flights a year, 33 tons of CO2 emissions. In your car, going to work, 400 kilometers a week for a year in a two liter petrol car, that's 5.72 tons on the train makes a big difference. In the same journey a year by a train is just 0.5 of a ton. Buildings though account for 34% uh, in the UK of greenhouse emissions. I imagine similar percentages apply to many other countries. So as we're seeing at the moment a lot of law firms are actually uh, cutting down their office space and um, reducing how much of buildings they use, even moving buildings. And in the process, uh, reducing their carbon footprint can only be a good thing. People working from home, not bad. So I'd say to you, ODR is here to stay. It has a lot of benefits both to employees, um, in terms of their work-life balance, and a lot of benefit to the planet. So long may it continue. There you go. Any questions, feel free them in the uh, question box. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Um, uh, I, we, we see that uh, if we take that spectrum that uh, Sophie mentioned about the different types of disputes and uh, in um, coming from uh, 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 something that's more um, adequate for uh, for automatic uh, uh, dispute resolution in going all the way to very complex issues that uh, still depend a lot on uh, human interaction. Uh, we we can see that even uh, human interaction uh, can rely on technology, and in, and in, in that's as you as you said, that is something that the pandemic has shown. Uh, 
uh, is unavoidable right now. And uh, it's certainly uh, an interesting issue to discuss later uh, how, uh, how a tribunal uh, should uh, overcome the lack of uh, consensus, uh, the lack of, lack of agreement on this, considering on the other hand, how, um, um, how it may be impossible to move on uh, without uh, some use of technology nowadays. And well, th thank you so much. Uh, well, we, we, we go now to our um, final speaker, uh, Carmen uh, Isfeir, uh, is a lawyer uh, admitted in Chile, in Brazil, in, uh, in the UK. Uh, she, she is a member of our branch here in Brazil, as I said in the beginning, she is the head of the subgroup on technology and ADR. And she has had years of experience as in-house uh, counsel in, in, in several different industries, uh, which uh, uh, gives her uh, a, 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 a very practical uh, approach uh, to how companies uh, face uh, these uh, issues of, of technology and, and, and in dispute resolution in this environment. And uh, she will uh, go back to a topic that we were discussing before, uh, where some of the uh, issues related to artificial intelligence and how that interplays with international arbitration. So Carmen, uh, you have the floor now. Thank you, Cesar. Um, so good afternoon to everybody. Good evening to you. Uh, Distinguished co-panelists, I am very honored to uh, be able to join you today. And uh, after such interesting presentations, I hope I can do my best to uh, represent here the Brazil brunch. And yes, uh, I am going to go back after Damien's uh, very interesting ODR presentation. I am going to go back to uh, issues relating to uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other technologies, but related to its application to arbitration. And I hope uh, uh, it's not gonna be, of course, uh, as Parrish um, uh, looked into from the ethical perspective, which I think it's essential, but I'm gonna be a little bit more cynical and try to make some um, statements and questions that stimulate the critical thinking uh, of all of us. So having said that, um, so uh, in order to assess this subject, I, I, I started uh, researching and I, I found this very interesting uh, material um, called the Vienna Propositions for Innovative and Scientific Methods and Tools in International Arbitration. And this was published uh, in a very interesting publication where I also had the honor of uh, uh, writing an article called the Austrian Yearbook of International Arbitrator, Ar Arbitration in, uh, from the year 2020, so it's quite current. So a group of experienced and well-known traditional arbitrators, some traditional uh, conservatives, some very young and uh, um, technology friendly got together in what uh, they called the World Cafe Table, which is quite suggesting thinking of the beautiful uh, cafes in Vienna. And uh, they started uh, to discuss subjects uh, regarding um, internet, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, for example. And for this discussion, I just want to um, set it clear what I'm talking about when I say uh, artificial intelligence. I am referring to the umbrella term for a variety of underlying computing technologies that exhibit or stimulate uh, or simulate uh, human intelligence. Okay, so just the broad definition. And when we're speaking about machine learning, it's the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience so they can learn. So let's see some um, examples that I have chosen to uh, see whether all this uh, uh, artificial intelligence and technology 
are applicable to arbitration? How can they help us? And uh, where are the red lights uh, we have to look at? So let's think uh, in the first case that I put is the dispute management process and specifically uh, the early case assessment. Uh, so we all know that early case assessment encompasses actions and assessments to determine the best suited way to manage a certain dispute. And it's also a very well known concept in arbitration. So uh, complex disputes need a very deep case uh, assessment uh, with collection and review of large amounts of data and exhausting uh, analytic uh, um, uh, work. So uh, to the end of presenting a concrete and coherent uh, um, claim to the tribunal. So it involves gathering of information, it involves identification of the client and the opponent's business interests, uh, and also the analysis of the forum and of uh, who is the other part in the dispute. And uh, only after this uh, very thorough analysis of uh, early case assessment is that you think of the possibility of settlement because only then you know uh, if your case is strong enough. Um, so the use of analytical tools to determine your case strategy uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the course of arbitration in complex dis disputes seems to be an interesting alternative uh, in, in the practical world and uh, some dare to say it's a requirement to make arbitration more cost efficient and, and to make uh, this management uh, help the resolution of these disputes. And yes, there are benefits uh, of the early case assessment and use of technology in identifying risks and uh, potential end game solutions and business needs uh, and everything that it considers, definitely. Uh, may reduce legal expenses or potential settlement costs, among others. Yes, it may. Um, let's take a particular uh, example of um, early case assessment that you all know for sure, and it's the decision tree analysis. So a decision tree is nothing else but uh, quantitative uh, diagrams with nodes and branches representing possible decision paths and possible outcomes. So in a way or uh, another, even if you haven't heard about decision trees, which I doubt, uh, all of us when facing a uh, dispute, uh, we built this kind of uh, mechanism. We imagine possible reactions and possible arguments. And also we try to imagine uh, the outcomes of uh, these decisions. So that's what, what it is. And currently there are software programs uh, that help in the construction, uh, a fast and easy construction building of these decision trees. For example, there is one from um, uh, Precision Tree uh, in palisade.com. I can make this uh, data available afterwards. And also there are uh, other uh, softwares relating to decision trees that um, allow you to connect relevant legal issues to documents and evidence. And, and this is, for example, knowledge tools.de. Uh, it's a German uh, site. So uh, the possibilities are open, and uh, I can identify at least three users that would benefit from uh, such programs. Think of the council and his clients. No? He can make uh, decision trees with outcomes and legal data uh, for litigation, arbitration, and mediation. Arbitral tribunal, in the case of arbitration, uh, they can determine the structure of the relevant issues they're going to consider. They can imagine possibilities and different outcomes, and they can use it even as a guideline for uh, drafting the final decision. 
and also litigation founders in the case of uh, arbitration founding. This is very important uh, to, to help them to predict the outcome of the dispute and if it's uh, worth to finance it or not. So these tools are out there and of course uh, it seems like it's very reasonable and recommendable to uh, use them. But as everything in life, they have risks. And uh, uh, I want to quote a professor, a German professor called Ulrich Hagel, uh, who wrote a very interesting um, article called uh, Der Unternehmensjurist als Risikomanager, die mysteriöse Welt von Risikoanalysen und Entscheidungsräume, which is nothing else than uh, the commercial lawyer ask risk manager and the mysterious world of risk analysis and decision tree. So what does he say? I, I found it particularly um, interesting. He says, no one should deny that a decision tree is only as good as the thought and analysis that goes into it. So what I, I'm trying to tell you is that the output is only as good as the input. And you can have the best program, but it's the quality of the information you put into it. And I'm going to go over and over this uh, during my presentation. From this, from what you put is uh, the uh, kind of analysis, the quality and quantity analysis and the certainties that you can get as output. So this is a very important thing to bear in mind. I can think of two main risks of a decision tree uh, made in the way you want. First of all, if you are the party's counsel, uh, you might have different understanding of what the key legal issues are than the arbitrators. That's one risk. So you can start a, complete, a completely wrong path of decision tree because you have a different standpoint. And the second one is that as party counsel, you may fail in determining the dependency of the different legal questions. So you, you pose them in an inaccurate sequence. And this can also impact the outcome of your uh, predictions for the decision tree. So uh, <clears throat> the risk is at the very end an imprecise estimation of the outcomes and uh, the possible risks in litigation. So that is one example where we have uh, benefits and downsides. Uh, the next one that I would like to uh, propose to you is the big data predictive analytics uh, that also had been, uh, had, has been mentioned by Parrish and I think uh, somehow by, by Sophie. Uh, I think this is very relevant because predictability in international arbitration is paramount. Um, clients would want to know what their chances are for success. So um, the chances of success uh, in a claim or in a defense uh, impact the client's decision to proceed with the claim, to launch a defense, to look for a settlement, or even to look for alternative dispute methods different from arbitration. And this is also important for arbitration founding for the same reasons. So the term big data predictive analytic combines two different ideas. One is the predictive analytics, which is an area of statistics that deals with extracting information from existing data in order to predict future outcomes and trends. This is a definition according to Van Beel. So they use different techniques like machine learning and like predicting modeling. And big data is the collection of large and complex data sets. So the prediction in this case is based on this big data, which is a large and complex uh, data set. And uh, in the legal context, uh, big data predictive analytics can be used at least in the following, to predict um, how a specific legal question will be most likely decided by a court or an arbitration 
uh, arbitration tribunal or a single arbitrator and what arbitrators personalities culture values are so the personality of arbit arbitrators as you know may differ and this may really swing the outcome of cases sometimes and so we're speaking about the idiosyncrasies of arbitrators and arbitrator panels and uh, the broad des discretion that arbitration arbitrators have uh, to apply the various applicable laws and all this single causes, they cause a great amount of uncertainty. So if we could use big data predictive analytics to make things more sure, we do it. Yes, these analytics are a tool to, to help and find make arguments that are better if we consider the certain personality of the arbitrators that compose the panel. How do I present my case? How do I present myself? How do I gain the attention of the arbitral panel if I have this information in advance? This might help me. So in the case of um, investment arbitration, this is quite easy because uh, many awards are public. So the, there is a whole bunch of information available. Not so easy is in the case of international commercial arbitration or ad hoc arbitration, where the awards are generally not public. So this presents a challenge for the use of big data predictive analytics. And uh, it's harder for councils and clients uh, to make accurate predictions of the outcome and chances of success. Uh, where is it used then? Well, there's a good example of machine learning like technology used by the European court, uh, not used, but uh, used in cases uh, to predict the outcome of cases, I'm sorry, uh, from the European Court of Human Rights. This is currently being used. Um, so in general, we can say that machine learning can help uh, councils and clients to increase predictability for claims and uh, providing more accurate information to decide uh, whether to take a certain step or not. But it's important to know, uh, and here comes the flaw, that uh, machine learning analyzed the outcome based on past cases. And this brings me to uh, a book I'm currently reading that has nothing to do with law or with technology. Uh, it's, it's a book that you might know because it's uh, actually on the top of the bestsellers from uh, Nicolas uh, Taleb. It's a Lebanese uh, American uh, citizen called Anti-Fragile. And one of his comments is very, very interesting, especially if you bear in mind that he wrote this book before COVID-19 came up. And what he says is that uh, the um, risk assessment professionals, they all base their predictions in past disasters and risks in everything that went wrong in the past. So uh, it's very hard for them in his own words to see the black swan, which is another book of him coming. Black swan being a, a situation that couldn't be predicted that was totally unexpected after a period of total calm. And this is exactly what make uh, systems fragile. So think of this adapted to machine learning and arbitration. So this brings me to the risks of this. So the first one would be that the assessment performed by these tools depend on the quantity and the quality of the data because we're speaking of analytics based on big data. So. Uh, in order to count with, uh, with this analysis, we need the big data and we need it to be big data. So not just bits and pieces of uh, information. So you need, you need to have this critical information mass in order to give the system some reliability. And uh, as we know, in international commercial arbitration, most um, awards are not public. So we would be missing this critical mass. The second one is that uh, there can be data-driven biases. 
produced by the quality of the existing, existing information pool, the set of information you have, since usually the data sets are composed uh, not of useful data, but of the available da data. So the pools are formed by the data that is out there, but that doesn't mean that that is the most useful information for the analysis. Uh, another problem is that uh, information regarding, uh, there is out there a lot of information uh, that is random and some of that information regards to uh, awards or decisions that are wrong. Do we want machine learning to learn from what is wrong? We don't actually. And the last but not least is the tr transparency. And I think um, it was Parrish that mentioned that uh, about the transparency and control of this process. Yeah, because it concerns uh, about this big data and uh, people kind of tend to think that it operates and he mentioned it like a black box. Um, one provides the input in the hope to see trustworthy output coming back. But it really, uh, the system is totally influenced by the other factors I just mentioned. So uh, that's it. The gentleman from this uh, World Cafe table concluded at the time, and I want to quote it but because I think it's interesting and it has, had been said here in one way or the other, is that the mind cannot be replaced. Yes, we can, after uh, revising the analysis, disagree on it and uh, follow our guts feeling, our instinct, our uh, preparation, our years of experience, as uh, Parish mentioned it as well. Spirit experience counts in a lot. And uh, the councils need to do a reality check on the results of what they get. And finally, there was a very interesting one saying that using only analytical tools and machine learning takes all the fun away. And uh, yeah, it is so. So I am heading to my uh, last example, uh, which is uh, what someone called the shortcomings of human arbitrators, like emotion and the arbitrator's biases. So, um, it is supposed that increased rationality in decision making aided by artificial intelligence and machine learning on international arbitration, uh, making it more logic based on algorithms maybe, uh, can suppress uh, some human uh, undesirable, and I put this in quotation marks, uh, elements like emotion and biases, or at least help to reduce, to reduce this. So, um, the using of, of, of these tools would uh, increase rationality and would increase legitimacy of arbitration and would diminish criticism and uh, would make uh, uh, international arbitration even more popular. Uh, there are some examples out there of what there, uh, are called just outcomes that can be reached through um, um, artificial intelligence uh, tools. Um, for example, eliminating emotion. Do we really want to eliminate emotion from arbitration? Is that something that we want? Uh, I ask myself. Um, the problem that you have, for example, in the case that you use um, these tools to make the decisions more rational by, for example, picking the right arbitra arbitrators, like choosing um, objectively, the arbitrators is that uh, only by using uh, machine learning and technology, you, you cannot know what the combination of the human personalities of these arbitrators are going to be and how are these people going to work together. It can well be that their personalities clash and this derives in a lot of inefficiencies, problems, and perhaps uh, an improper, to, to put it somehow, award. So do we want to eliminate emotions? Do, will we be able to eliminate emotions? And then regarding, uh, finally, and I'm closing with this, the elimination of human bias. Again, do we want to, can we eliminate human bias? Is, is this possible? So 
uh, speaking about the independence of the and impartiality of arbitrators. Uh, we all agree that in most Western countries, um, there is little discussion and there are lots of rules to guarantee independence and impartiality of arbitrators, but not so for uh, uh, being free of biases, because uh, there, that is something that we've considered not possible for the human beings. So, there are many rules uh, for securing dependent, independence and impartiality, but not uh, biases. So new technologies could help us doing this. So what is the bias? What is a bias then? So it's an inclination to prejudice for or against one person or group, especially in a way considered to be unfair. This is according to the Cambridge Dictionary. So even if the best arbitrator, let's think, in the world would understand all the relevant facts of the case. His or her bias, which is there, still puts the risk that he or she will not draw the right conclusion. It's not going to be totally fair, correct, perfect, because he or she is biased. But let's think, what do we want with this elimination of bias? What do the parties want? I think the party's primary interest uh, is not to get the correct decision, is to get a legitimate, legal, well-drafted, enforceable, favorable decision. They want a favorable decision for their case. And the council, well, when he chooses arbitrators, he is also thinking of the kind of arbitrator he can somehow influence, impress, at least in the first audience, you know? So if a panel was unbiased, so what are the, this early chances of influencing the procedure, the proceedings uh, by this lawyer? I'm speaking of legitimate influence, of course. So think of the, uh, example that um, post Amazon. Uh, Amazon had um, a program with algorithms uh, in order to mechanize the um, job selecting. So people that were applying for a job and over 10 years it worked with uh, information um, coming from the uh, job candidates that were mostly men because uh, initially technology was uh, a, a man's world. There were little, a few women uh, that were intervening and studying technology. So this system was fed somehow with male information. So, so when women came and started to uh, apply for jobs in technology, this system seemed to be rejecting them somehow. And this is why, because the input influence the output, risk posed by in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and technologies in international arbitration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Carmen, for such a, a, a detailed and uh, comprehensive uh, a, a discussion about this about this topic. And uh, it's uh, it, it's interesting. You mentioned litigation funding. And, and that's all. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, I think I find very in, intriguing because we, in, in it, it may be uh, a, a way to understand how, uh, whether uh, these tools uh, uh, can can really uh, become um, reliable. Because uh, I, if if you think of a funder, uh, which will uh, will predict its investment in a case uh, based on that type of analysis. Uh, and uh, if, if, as that progresses, uh, well, we can understand that uh, well, uh, uh, nobody uh, uh, that's rational would bet their money uh, based on something that's not uh, reliable, right? And, and, that, and that may be maybe a way to test uh, how uh, how reliable those uh, tools uh, become in, in time. Uh, the fact that uh, litigation or arbitration funders uh, rely more and more 
on predictions based on on uh, processing of, of data uh, like that. In uh, um, uh, one uh, issue that you you discussed that I also found uh, very um, uh, interesting was the the fact that um, council and parties and clients uh, may want to uh, adopt this um, uh, this type of of machine based analysis in order to better prepare their cases and to uh, predict what, what what's probably going to happen maybe decide to settle and uh, uh, I, I I don't know what uh, what what your opinion is and I maybe that may be something for us to discuss now uh, but I, I think we will see a lot of party use of these tools before we can deal with the fact that a tribunal or a decision maker will uh, create, for instance, a decision tree uh, based on on a prediction uh, on a machine based prediction uh, tool, uh, which might uh, entail uh, a, a lot of due process and transparency issues. A party basically is free to use those tools as much as, as they want, and uh, in, 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 in it will probably grow much more in the hands of parties. And it, until it becomes uh, something that we, we understand is truly useful and may, may escalate to the level of decision makers before we actually have to deal with that, before we have to uh, have a hearing in which a tribunal will discuss how they will build, how they will structure a decision tree in order to uh, have an algorithm that will process thousands and thousands of, of documents and information and come up with a, with a draft decision that uh, the tribunal will then discuss. Uh, okay, well, we have some questions from the audience. I think we can um, start with that before, uh, and then later. Um, the first questions that we received were about uh, Sophie's um, discussion, uh, and um, uh, I, I don't know, Sophie, I, I, have you have you taken a look at the Q and A here? Because uh, these are two uh, two questions by Pedro Ribeiro from the Brazilian branch, and uh, they the the first one basically deals uh, with the fact that um, uh, the latest. Uh, economics theories are, are, are moving away from the presumption of a rational behavior and uh, in, in showing that people um, act with emotional bias uh, as well. And um, uh, if we think of a Claro's type of, of uh, decision, um, uh, in, uh, that, uh, which is basically uh, a, a reflection on what we think others people or other people or other people will decide. Uh, the question is, uh, wouldn't that be only unjust, but even possibly illegal? And then um, that question is complemented based on what Paresh said later. And um, uh, uh, um, is there a way for us to have some certainty? that uh, when when people vote for what they think other people will vote for, uh, that uh, uh, that could be uh, the best decision from a social point of view. So uh, can you comment on that, please? Yes, uh, Pedro, thank you very much for uh, extremely insightful questions. And you're hitting, obviously, at the nub of, um, of the concerns about the Claris model of justice. I will take your second question first because um, the question is, you know, voting according to the shelling point, i.e., how do I think others will vote, other people who are my peers who also want maximum financial gain? Uh, how, is that the best way from a societal perspective? And that answer, the answer to that question rather is, you know, where does the new society, the decentralized society, places its trust? And the question, the, the answer is as well, if, if um, participants in e-commerce uh, trust their peers 
above others or will say to themselves, no decision-making uh, system is perfect, but I prefer the judgment of peers to the judgment of a centralized authority that I don't, that I don't think is you know, acting in my best interests, then uh, the answer to your question is yes, it's the best decision from a social point of view. Uh, it really, the, what I find fascinating about blockchain and Kleros, as I said at the beginning, is that it forces us to rethink society. And we are living in a world where um, this, the importance of social media and the value given by, to, to what other people think of our pictures, our holidays, our achievements on LinkedIn is immense. Uh, it is way bigger than it used to be. Um, so it's a, not such a big step to start from that sort of environment and go to uh, an environment where justice is dispensed by those people whose likes we value so much. I'm projecting, of course. Uh, so that's, I think you're, that, that's why you, I think your second question hits at the, at the very, and I, I don't have a view on that. I think that's a way, a way that society will evolve. And for the e-commerce disputes, where participants are often from across the globe, uh, don't know each other, will never interact again. Uh, it may well be that peer-to-peer -peer is the is the way that carries the most trust from a social perspective. Uh, on your first point, um, is the shelling point decision making leading to uh, fairness or illegality? Uh, if it were applied to uh, decisions where uh, I, I, that's my answer, and then I'll give you Claros's answer. My answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, if you are applying a pure shelling point perspective of maximum financial gain uh, to a legal dispute. At the moment, we're not talking about that because as I said, these are mostly crypto listing disputes where you look at the criteria for listing a token and then you decide if that meets or not the criteria. So the, the, the justice element is very slim, uh, but, but for something legal, definitely you're absolutely right that sh the shelling point and, and legality don't necessarily coincide. The, the Claros answer to your question is, all of this is rectified by the appeal system. Because ev with every appeal, the number of jurors is exponentially bigger. And so statistically, the greater number of people will get to the right answer. I find there's a lot of problem with that answer, but that's, that's what they're saying. I think the model needs a refining, essentially, uh, from, from its very experimental uh, start. Thank you. Uh, Paresh, I, I, I have a question for you based on something that Sophie said in the beginning. Uh, uh, we, uh, the, what, 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 one of Clarice's uh, um, first concern was the lack of justice in the, in the uh, I think, Sophie, you mentioned that uh, one of the creators of Clarence is from Argentina, right? Which is, uh, has a, a similar problem the uh, the one we we have in Brazil and and probably most um, emerging uh, markets. Uh, but um, um, Paresh, and uh, in, in you, Paresh, uh, mentioned specifically that your 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 work with refugees and um, the the idea of uh, this uh, uh, lack of justice uh, based on the traditional way of delivering justice. Uh, how, how, how do you think that uh, influences the, the way we should see uh, instruments such as Claros or some other alternative uh, uh, way of dispensing uh, justice? Uh, 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 how, how does that balance with the, of course, the ethical and the uh, legal uh, difficulties of that kind of, uh, of alternative? Uh, it, is that something that you think is decisive for us to uh, maybe see um, uh, an alternative system uh, like that uh, as uh, possibly inevitable in terms of reaching uh, a, 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 an adequate level of dispensation of justice? It's an interesting question. I'd just like to pick up on something that Sophie said about social media. Um, and again, I'll give you the historical context first. If we go back before social media, human relations were built upon, of course, interaction, communicating with each other, sitting over a meal and having a, a conversation. Now, what we tend to find is that um, even the small things like conversations are being, you know, 
mediated through, through technology, WhatsApp, uh, Twitter, other forms of technology. And I think there's a risk, of course, these forms of technology are good, but there's also a risk that even in our everyday communications, they'll become automated and instrumentalized. That rather than, you know, basically feeling, thinking, acting and doing, we will just be hardwired and programmed to, to basically just respond to touching a, a, a screen or just thinking ourselves, our rational process will become automated without us even knowing it. And if we take this on an individual level and project it up to a social level, I guess there is always the fear of the risk that we're moving towards a society which in and of itself is becoming largely automated. And we're beginning to lose our touch of what it means to be human and with all those feelings and emotions that we have. And we're kind of, they're now being replaced by, well, you know, what's the, what's the number, what's the code and what's the algorithm. So, and that's one of the reasons I'm so attached to the sort of human and the philosophical things. I think there's an element of, of, of the, of, something within this and we need to rescue ourselves rescue what it means to be human but i feel that going to the future what we'll see is largely more automation and we'll see a, a we'll see legislation which will be turned from words into code in order to make it uh, computer friendly life will become much more automated and ergo justice will become a lot more automated so if i want to know what's just what's right what's wrong Rather than work it out for myself, I'll be just turning to a machine and typing into a computer and asking the machine will just tell me what it is. And that's not a bad thing. I'm, I mean, I'm not completely against technology. I, I, I tell them, I, I'm actually pro-technology. But what I'm saying is that within that technology, we should not lose what it means to be ourselves as well. And, and you know, we see it these days, you go to like a restaurant, you see couples talking, not talking to each other on the phone, etc. cetera. I, I think we need to, arrest ourselves from that. And what I see is an also greater objective and automated form of justice where we lose ourselves in that. Thank you. Uh, and I have one final question here for uh, Damien and Carmen. Uh, it's asked, uh, it's, uh, may, you may be able to see it here on chat. Uh, and it, it was asked by Mauricio Gom, our friend also from uh, the Brazilian branch. And um, it deals uh, with uh, uh, something that Damien mentioned, the uh, 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 multiple language um, uh, uh, possible feature of uh, ODR and uh, in, a, in a combination with artificial intelligence. Uh, the, the, the question has to do with the uh, difficulties in uh, multi-language communication in international arbitration and uh, in, in the, the in it asks whether uh, at one point we will have uh, artificial intelligence um, uh, uh, capabilities that will be uh, be, uh, be able to uh, supersede the need for uh, actual translators and interpreters and or uh, or or is that something that we will not see uh, a, 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 a machine uh, that's able to uh, grasp the subtleties of uh, emotion in language, and especially if you have to deal with multiple languages. Um, uh, uh, what's your your views on that, David? Yeah, so I'll, I'd like to say that quite a start anyway. Um, yes, yeah, so it's actually uh, interestingly, this is something that we're exploring uh, right now. Um, and um, there are some challenges. Uh, technology exists today to make speech um, to text um, in an automated way um, and then translating it. Um, that, that actually exists today as technology. Um, the, the, the challenge is the accuracy. Um, and, uh, and that's partly driven by if the language is English to Spanish, for example, English to Portuguese, um, uh, that's probably going to be more accurate um, than, than English uh, to, to a, a, a less well-known language. Um, and um, the, the, the accuracy, uh, the nuance, uh, you use that word, um, is missing. Um, the, the, the context can be used and, and there's great strides um, using, let's call it artificial intelligence, um, uh, machine learning. Um, but uh, right now, the technology is not there to, to be completely accurate. Um, definitely misses stuff. 
Um, if you if you want something that uh, a quick transcript at the end of a, of a session, um, then that technology exists now. Now and um, that can be very useful to remind you about certain things that were said or or if it, they were speaking in another language or or had an accent um, that you couldn't quite grasp. Um, then, then, then you can have that at the, at the end of, of a hearing now that, that exists today. In the future, it will get better and better, and it is getting better and better. I mean, Google Translate um, is improving. You know, for certain languages, the accuracy is, is improving, but we all know the, the experience of, of Google Translate um, can, can get it right, can get it horribly wrong as well. Um, so it's coming, definitely coming. I know that technology to interpret translate exists. And Los Pereira, uh, these are. So while he comes back, maybe I can um, compliment what you were saying, Damien. I, I fully agree. Um, there is a platform which uh, I used uh, uh, when I did an ODR certification course with Daniel Rainey and Ana Gonzalez. Uh, called Kudo that offers the possibility or offered the possibility of uh, uh, simultaneous translation between uh, English and Portuguese and uh, Cesar is back and uh, but um, you're back Cesar but uh, regarding language I what I wanted to say is that language is not just words language uh, is culture, language is local emotions, language is uh, the story of that uh, people, language is uh, it's the ancestral memory. So uh, when you are trying to translate from different languages, you find lots of words that have no word-to-word -word translation in another language. We have many in Portuguese, many in Spanish and in other languages as well, German, French. And so the thing is, yes, we're walking towards there and it's getting better and better and it is useful. Uh, I don't think we should reject it, but I think, again, we should use our critical mind to understand when it's put to the best uh, to be used with the best interest of everybody because sometimes words combined with culture and emotion may say something totally different than what a machine can understand so that has to be taken into place especially uh, in arbitration arbitration proceedings my opinion yeah uh, uh yeah it's uh, it's ironic that i i got, i got disconnected here by technology Right in this uh, technology in uh, in dispute resolution webinar. So uh, well, um, we have reached our time limit, and I I believe you all from the audience uh, agree that we have had a wonderful discussion here with our with our panelists, uh, and uh, I I would like to thank uh, again uh, Sophie Paresh uh, Damien. Uh, Carmen and all of you uh, for joining us uh, today in the, on this uh, technology subgroup uh, of the, uh, the Brazil Brazil branch of CIR, and I would like to uh, um, invite you to follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn for uh, the new activities for 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 all, everything that we have been doing. Uh, in the Brazil branch uh, in regard to several different aspects of dispute, dispute resolution. Uh, with this, I thank you all again and uh, uh, well, well, goodbye and see you next time. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.